Good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fifth and last webinar of the 2023-2024 EMOS webinar program. My name is Caterina Giusti. I'm Associate Professor of Statistics at the University of Pisa in Italy. As a member of the EMOS team of my university, I'm working at the organization of this webinar program on behalf of Eurostat, together with the German company Startup. Today, I will act as the webinar moderator. Now, let me first explain for any newcomers that IMO stands for the European Master in Official Statistics, a joint project of universities and data producers in the EU member states, EFTA, and EU candidate countries. If your university is interested in applying for the IMOS label, please consider that the permanently open call for universities is available on the IMOS dedicated page on the Eurostat website. For staying in contact with the EMOS news and community, please follow the EMOS on LinkedIn and on the new EMOS web page on Cross. It's now time to start with our webinar. Before I give the floor to our speakers, let me first briefly explain how we run the webinar today. As you can see, I already know, this here, the EMOS webinar stream on Zoom. The webinar is recorded and the recording will be uploaded on the EMOS YouTube channel, where you can already find the recordings of the past webinars as well as the past two EMOS workshop. As a participant, you can watch and listen to the webinar. You can also use the Q&A manager to post questions to the presenters during the webinar. Our speakers will be answering questions on two occasions during today's webinar, one time during the speech, and one as a part of the final discussion. Do you have, should you have any technical problems or questions, please send a message in the chat and you will be contacted by one of the members of the technical staff. So today I have the pleasure to host Michael Ronsis and Talita Grayling. And Michael holds a PhD in business economics as he currently coordinator for data and methods at Statistic Flanders. He is a qualified, high qualified data scientist with research in data mining and publication in top journals. Talita holds a PhD in economics and she's currently professor at the University of Johannesburg. She specializes in well-being economics and quality of life study and has a keen interest in the fourth industrial revolution applications. Talita is involved in several international projects and collaboration related to well-being research. And today they will present about national sentiment statistics through social media, obstacles and opportunities. So I leave the floor now to Talita for the first part of the presentation. Jorina, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invite. I am very happy to share some of my research with you. Okay, so as you can see, what I will be presenting is the way we use big data or social media to actually measure the well-being or subjective well-being of people. Um, and just showing you what we've done, how we did it, is it possible, is it not possible? I could just some introduction to my presentation. I will briefly explain what subjective well-being, because often it's a it's a, a very not that concrete idea, and people confuse the definitions. Then I will chat about big data and social media, which most people know. So I'll briefly scan over that. Then I will tell you more about our project, which is the Gross National Happiness Today project, which actually measures happiness, evaluative happiness in real time, or did up to the time it was switched off by our dear friend. And then we will look into the validation of that data. I will give you some examples where we applied the data to show you um, how the data reflects what's happening. And sorry about that. Um, and then if I have time, I'll show you some of the new applications we've done to new research questions and a conclusion. So let's start with the idea of subjective well-being. So subjective well-being is normally, is a, obviously, it's a subjective measure of measuring well-being. And if we look at it, it can be divided in two concepts. The one is a longer-term evaluation of your life. So a question like, how satisfied are you with your life in general? And then there will be a scale that you can answer not satisfied at all, to very satisfied. So that is the question you will most often find in any of your statistical or your surveys that you get and will also be included nowadays in some of your statistical data. Then on the other side, we've got effect measures. Now those effect measures will be in our terms of in our line of research, it will be happiness. So we, we will say happiness and we will have that is the short term, it's more emotion. You get positive emotion, happy and 
cheery, negative emotions, being depressed or angry. So the differentiation. And uh, where do we fit in? If we look at well-being or sentiment analysis, it will very often either rather be to the effect side. So the short-term positive emotions that we measure, though, we can also do a few things and measure life satisfaction. All right, so what is big data? Now, most of you know what big data is, but the benefit of big data is there's a lot of it. It's voluminous. It is normally collected at a high velocity. There is so many sources. If we just think of the sources of big data, there's health sector data. There is financial institutions data, banking data. Then other things that one probably don't think about is Google searches, it's data. And then social media, which will be something we concentrate on today. And then we find, obviously, if the big data, you find your structured data, your unstructured, semi-structured, structured, something like you see in Excel, unstructured, your text data that we use. Um, then just a few things about social media. Where do we derive social media from? And you will see that is normally from your posts. You will get images, uh, videos, comments. Basically, what it does, it gives the opinion of people about something. And that is what we are interested in. So it's the opinion, so the subjective part of what a person think about something and also then what we will use to measure something like subjective well-being or happiness. So, so social media is basically the, the source of the media we're using or the data. Uh, just looking at various platforms at this stage, and you will all be familiar with them, is Facebook, but you know what I didn't realize? There's 3.5 billion Facebook users at this stage. That's approximately half of the world's population. It's a wonderful data source. Then we've got Twitter. Um, I've added the numbers of Twitter users, 450. This will, um, at this stage, it's X. It's no longer Twitter. Instagram, 2 billion. WhatsApp, 2 billion. TikTok, Reddit. Uh, Pinterest, Snapshot, YouTube, and then I added Google Trends, although it's not a social media platform, but it's something that has potential for us for future research. So um, what is the advantages of big data on social media data? There's a few, few advantages. It's much cheaper to collect than doing surveys. We can collect it at real time. We already know it is really voluminous. It's a big amount of data. Um, it's continuously updated. People comment the whole time and we can see their opinions continuously. What we find here is people is not answering a question. This is their opinions about something. So you find it's unbiased and passive data. Um, from the data, you can attain some behavioral insights, meaning that you can listen to what people are thinking um, almost in real time. But there's a lot of limitations of this data as well. And for example, we uh, it's, it's not really representative because we know that everybody doesn't tweet or has, have a Facebook page. But what we can say is there's been many efforts to make it more representative, to weight it. So it's something with research that we mo most likely will overcome. And then if we analyze big data, we need a little bit more um, computational power, maybe a little more, more sophisticated methodologies, but I don't think that will really limit us. And big data is not a substitute for survey data. Survey data can inform us about other topics than big data. So we, we would like to have both. Um, and it's also robustness checks, the one for the other. And then with big data, the quality of the data is absolutely crucial. Here, it's really important, garbage in, garbage out. So we know that a big part of big data and big data analysis is cleaning the data. So what is the Gross National Happiness Project or what, what do we do? We use high frequency data, uh, which we extract from Twitter. And then we develop a time series data, but it is per hour or later per day, where we measure the happiness and emotions of populations. Um, what we get from using Twitter data is we call it evaluative emotions or evaluative happiness, because people will think of it before they write something, for example, in Twitter or post something. So they thought about it a bit, and then they will post whatever they think. 
And now initially this um, data set that we compiled and it was live and with the website, it's got the website, but it was continuously updating. Sorry, there must be a timer on that. Um, so we had 10 countries involved in the project, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Belgium, Germany, Great Britain, France, Italy, the Netherlands, Spain, and Luxembourg. I didn't mention Luxembourg there because um, in our analysis, often the sample was very small, although we could get some information on the um, Luxembourg. Then we had a fun project, which we did with the FIFA World Cup soccer. We extended these countries to include quite a few of the countries playing soccer. And so you will also see some of my ex uh, examples I'll share will be from the FIFA World Soccer Cup. So just a little bit on lexicons. We Often when I present people, are, I, I will say the word lexicon and they're not sure what it means. So we use lexicons in natural language processing to determine the sentiment of a tweet in this case, but you can use it for any text. So what is a lexicon? A lexicon is a library of words um, which is used in natural language processing. So it's, it's a database and what it can do is it understand what it can read the human uh, language. It can translate it in, in a way that machines can read it. And then in our case, we do the sentiment analysis. In other words, it can also determine the sentiment of what we call a tokenized, uh, some text. So it can say, is that text positive, negative, neutral? And then in some cases, we can also define the emotion, for example, anger, sadness, joy, um, anticipation. So if we use lexicons, and you will see that with sentiment analysis and obviously the development of natural language processing, we will see many uh, sophisticated methods to actually determine the type of sentiment. Now, lexicon is a rule-based method. So you've got certain words and it has been allocated. The word was said it was positive, negative, or it captures a certain emotion. So the reason why would you use a lexicon if there's maybe more developed methods at this stage? Well, the reason we use lexicons is number one is straightforward. If we want this to be used in a statistical offices, people need to understand the method behind it. So this is really very straightforward. You can see the word is already defined as positive, negative, or neutral. So it is not, um, and if we do use it in natural language processing, especially if it's at real time, it's not that computationally expensive. So if you use a more sophisticated method, for example, some type of machine learning, you had to have a big data set training it, um, using a lot of more, uh, it's, it's more, more computationally expensive. So this is just a straightforward way to do this. Um, it's very suitable for high frequency analysis. As a tweet comes in, we can analyze it and get the reading of that tweet and put it into an index very quickly. It's quite it's easy interpretable. So if you go back to, you've got the sentiment, but you can actually then go back to the tweet or the text where you find it and see why did you get that positive sentiment. So this you can explain quite a bit with that. All right, so I've just introduced you to lexicons. So what do we do? We extract tweets. I already said we use Twitter data. Um, we extract the tweets in real time and we extract approximately a million tweets or remember this use this project stock but a million tweets per day and the tweets are geolocated in other words we know where the people were that tweeted it it's got it's it's tagged um we extract on utf8 which means we can extract your emotions and emoticons as well once we have extracted it we determine the language of that tweet if we have a lexicon in that in the specific language, we will put it through that lexicon to get the, um, the emotion. If not, we will translate it and then use the English. Now, these are all many, many lexicons in the market. So we will use, we've used so many of them, but basically as robust and stays, when we ended the pro project, we were using VADA. Now, VADA is a relatively sophisticated lexicon. Um, it's used UTF-8, it can read emoticons, 
And we, I will show you what we actually managed to do using VEDA. We know at this stage there are much more sophisticated methods, even more sophisticated lexicons. All right, so what we do then is we get the scores. We average them per hour, so, um, normally per hour, but we also in the data we use in analysis, we do it per day. We derive an index and you, we use some kind of balance equations, a so positive versus negatives. We calculate the index. And when you see the gross national happiness, it will be a score from zero to 10. So zero not being happy, 10 being very happy. Now, the one thing that is very nice um, is that this data has already been accepted by official as official data by statistical office in New Zealand. And we know that the New Zealanders or are the leaders in well-being and well-being budgets and well-being, um, having well-being built into their whole statistical services. So we are very happy that they did accept the data. So just a few validity checks. Now, firstly, internal validity. So using time scale invariance, just to see if how you sample, if that will give a difference to your output. And you can actually see there on the different graphs, if you sample, per hour, or if you sample per six hour, or if you sample per day, you get approximately the same trend in your data. So we are happy with that test. Then uh, another test, internal validity, is just using volume invariance. If you extract a million tweets, 500 tweets, 100,000 tweets per day, does it make a big difference to what you get to measure? And we actually see no. The trends is still relatively similar. It, Still looks good. Um, then we did some external validations. So let's compare what we get with the gross national happiness. Um, we compare it to other measures. That is already survey measures. This one was compared to the Eurobarometer for summer 2020, looking at the average per countries over that time period. And you can see it's positively correlated. Then a few other tests. We did the same thing. Um, maybe you, you will be familiar with the EAR status of the World Health Organization. It measures mental health, or one of the documents measure mental health. So what we did is we compared our negative tweets, our trends that we got from there, uh, we compared that to mental health, and it was highly correlated at, at about 0 0.6, positively correlated, as you can also see from the graph. We did a similar exercise, and we compared the GNH, the Gross National Happiness Dot Today Happiness Index, against the happiness measure of the ONS, so the British Statistical Services. And once again, you can see it's highly correlated, um, even picking up some of the smaller movements. And yes, yeah, so it's also around, but it's, the correlation is also high, about 0 0.6. Then just some examples where we actually sat with the index in our one hand and we watched soccer to see if the index reflects what we see in the soccer game. Now maybe many of you will remember this was the first game in the whole World Cup soccer event where Argentina placed against Saudi Arabia and by far Argentina were the favorites. They could never lose this game and they lost it. So you can see what happened here. You can see the, there is where the game started. And this is Argentina. It depicts Argentina's happiness. There the game started. And you can see the happiness below the average drops very quickly as they see that this is not going to walk over and they lose the gap. So there's one example. I've got more from the soccer because it's so nice to see that. Um, I wonder if I missed one. Oh, this was Germany. When Germany won the game to Costa Rica, you can see the same thing. This is the graph actually depicts Germany and that green arrow shows you where the game starts and the increase in the happiness of the Germans as they win the game. Here's the final. This is quite interesting. In the final, it was France against Argentina and you can see France went in as the favorites and um, they actually lost the game at the end. So this is France going in as the favorites. There's their happiness. And you will remember this was a really exciting game. It was equal up to the end of the game. It was two each. Then they scored another goal in extra time. Then they went into kickoff. And at the end of the day, Argentina won. And there you can see. You can see the whole what happened through the whole game, just following the index. One last example. 
is because we're South Africa and we won the World Cup. Uh, just to see what happened to the South Africans' happiness as we won the World Cup. And you can see the same thing here. The game started 6.7. South Africa's happiness is relatively low on average or lower than European countries. And there you can see it's spiking. This is the end of the game. This is one of the highest happiness measures ever that we have experienced in South Africa. All right, so um, I think I'm almost running out of time. So just a little bit about the future, what will happen in the future. Now, what happened is Elon Musk took over Twitter um, and he closed the book on Twitter research. I think Michal will tell us more about that. So that is the end of this project as well. Even though we saw that we actually got very robust measures from a relatively simplistic method, um, Twitter was closed. And we can't really find a substitute for Twitter. And if we do, it will be some type of paid media, which would really be very expensive. So we're looking at other options. We've already looked at Facebook. Um, we did an index on Facebook, but it was it's not that easy to do. It's not as representative. The choices of the pages and the posts is very subjective. At the moment, we're looking into Google Trends. Google Trends is obviously not giving an opinion, but a search of a person. And then we start linking it to emotions. Uh, watch the space. I think very soon you might see some indices coming from there. And uh, please, Kateria, tell me, am I out of time? Yes. Katerina? Yes. yes am I are. out of time? Yes. Okay. Uh, all right. Here yeah, was the application, but you will mm -hmm. see, um, you can get the slides. This is just using the data. And this was using it in some machine learning model, uh, XGBoost. And the, the data is handled... It, reacts in a model as you expect it to react. So it, it is, you can see the theory is actually reflected in the data. I right, just a little bit, oh, this was all the applications, our model fits were good. Um, this is examples of papers where we have used the data. All of these are published. Um, you will see them. And when I give you the slides, you can also go and have a look at these papers. And the conclusion is, using social media data, we can capture the happiness and the emotions of people in real time. Remember, this is always it's a project ongoing, and we can always refine these measures. But even with the measures we used and being relatively simplistic, you could have seen it, it captured the emotion of people in different countries. And then what... Statistical offices must move into big data. We know that they're already experimenting with it, but this can be a major contribution to understanding what's happening in real time, what's happening to the emotions of people and the well-being of people, giving the better insights into how people feel, react to policies or events. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Talita. Uh, I received a couple of questions. I'm not sure that can be seen in the chat, so I will I will read them. So <clears throat> one question is: Thank you for the presentation. Can you also potentially interpret images and vocal messages shared on the socials? Can we interpret emojis? Yes, because yeah. we can extract on yeah. UTF-8, so we can actually the emoticons is is mm -hmm. um, included in UTF-8. Yes, so we can. Vocal messages, I guess, no. Pardon? Vocal messages. Vocal messages, yes, we can. Oh, we can yeah, really? do this, but we can because obviously voice has to be transferred into a text and then analyzed. Even visual, visual effects. Nowadays, we can analyze the sentiment. So, yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another question. As concern official statistics, do you think that the summary of your index, for example, an average level in a given year, can be compared somewhat with other indexes computing using standard data sources, such as uh, sample surveys? Or do you think that two measures are too different, so there is no uh, comparison we, possible? We, we actually showed in that external validation, and they can go have a look again, that is all comparisons to survey data. Mm -hmm. And we find statistically significant 
positive at about 0 0.6, which is strongly correlated. So yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so I don't think see any other question for the moment. So maybe at the end, you will receive some other questions. So I think that now we can give the floor to Michael. Yep, thank you very much, Katarina. And thank you so much, Salita, for that super interesting presentation. I think mine will uh, follow up nicely on that. I think one of your last slides, you mentioned statistical offices should start experimenting with these type of data. And in my presentation, I will uh, give the audience an idea of what it, what it means uh, to experiment with this type of data from an official statistics point of view. So my name is Michael Rusens. I'm a coordinator data and methods of statistics Flanders. And I, I will I will talk to you about an experiment with it with this data. And uh, I will explain to you. I think my key takeaway for you is going to be that this seems relatively simple from a technical point of view to set it up. But making the jump from getting an index out of it to getting a trustworthy index out of it that you can explain well to your public and to the people using your statistic is a big jump, but one that I think we can definitely take. So our work, um, we were very much inspired by others, amongst which uh, the Gross National Happiness Today project that uh, Talita just presented. But there is also some examples from uh, other statistical offices that have used Twitter data in their work. For example, in Italy, uh, there is a published statistic on the social mood on economy. So they use this as a complement to the consumer confidence uh, metric, which is a very important economic metric. So what they do there is they, they track tweets that have several keywords related to the economy in it. They measure the sentiment of those tweets and they see, well, if people speak very negatively about the economy on Twitter, this, they, in their studies, they show that this correlates quite strongly with the consumer confidence index. Also in other regions, such as the Netherlands, they have used Twitter data as complementary information to policymakers. Here in the screenshot, they, it shows uh, an indicator related to tweets uh, mentioning the coronavirus. And in this way, policymakers could really see uh, in a very timely matter how, the, how people reacted to certain events related to Corona. Let's say there's some extra restrictions were put in place, lockdown was enforced. They could see hour by hour how this was perceived to the public. So at Statistics Flanders, we, we, we saw all these examples and we were quite convinced that, hey, yeah, there, there could be some very interesting information about our society, about our population in this data source. Let's see if we can turn this into a useful index uh, for people using our statistics. So what we wanted to do is we took just one approach. Um, I will talk a lot about all the different research questions that pop up. There's there's, there's no uh, not a few of them, uh, but we just took a straightforward approach to get a first version of our indicator out and then start our research from that point of view. So in our first approach, we took a quite simplistic uh, definition of what sentiment means. Um, so in our case, the sentiment of a tweet is the, the opinion of the author on the tweet on the subject of their tweet. So I, I gave three examples here on this slide. So the first one, Antwerp, which uh, they, they refer a uh, soccer club. Antwerp for the win clearly indicates this is a positive tweet, has a positive sentiment because the author of this tweet clearly has a positive opinion on, on Antwerp and the fact that they won. Neutral tweets are, for example, the Hudson water level has risen. There's no uh, detectable explicit or implicit sentiment about the author on the fact that the water level has risen. You might say that, well, this, this has a risk of uh, flooding the region, and that's, that's true. But it could also just be a neutral fact, so we label those types of tweets as neutral. Um, an example of a negative tweet is, for example, down with the flu, again, and also a negative emoticon, this clearly shows that the person is negative, has a negative opinion that they are down with the flu, very understandably. So this is what we mean with uh, the sentiment of a tweet in our experiments. So positive, neutral, or negative. 
So wh why is statistical office? I think Talita already explained this very well. So Twitter is high frequency. It's quasi real time. If I tweet something now in a couple of seconds, our model could have picked it up already. It's, it used to be an open platform, let's say. So it was quite easy to get the data out of it. So we started as, okay, this is quite our traditional data source, such as survey data or registered data are more slow paced. They have a lower time to list. They have a lower frequency. This could be a very interesting complement to keep our finger on the pulse of our society regarding several topics. More generally, these types of experiments are, are framed in our, our data science hub, where, where we have observed that, well, policymakers and society just place higher and higher demands on, on the availability of statistics and of numbers. So we are very aware as a statistical office that we need to keep innovating, keep, need to keep pushing to improve our statistics so make, to make sure that we are actually providing relevant information. So this is why we're, we're trying to, to use these types of data sources that were previously not used in official statistics. So what does it look like? So what you can see here is a, a screenshot of our internal dashboard. So this is what I mean. Like we went just straight ahead, ignored some alternatives or trade-offs or things that would require a lot of research. We just were determined to build the first version and see from there. So what you can see here is that from the, the year January 1st, 2021, up until uh, the end of 2022, we track Twitter on an hourly basis. So this is a, a daily aggregate. And every day you could see the average sentiment score. So we have a bit of a different score than the Gross National Happiness Project. So one means everything was positive, zero means everything is negative. And so you see it fluctuates somewhere uh, in between. It has peaks, it has valleys, for example, it often has a peak at New Year's Eve and a Christmas day where we people wish each other a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. We also observed some peaks and valleys related to sports activities, festivities, and also um, other uh, events in society. From a bird's eye view, so this is a very high level, the technical picture. So while Talita presented a lexicon approach, we took a, a machine learning approach. So what we do is Starting from a specific tweet, we run it through a machine learning classifier that we train ourselves on labeled examples. And out of that classifier comes a probability prediction for each class. What is the probability that this tweet is negative? What is the probability that the tweet is positive? What is the probability that it's neutral? We take the highest probability and we assign the tweet with that sentiment. You can then aggregate that. You do that for a lot of tweets. We took about uh, 10,000 tweets per day, more or less, run it to that classifier, aggregated the information, and out of that comes a time series on the number of negative, neutral, and positive tweets. Well, what we, what's important here is that indeed Talita mentioned that if you want to do the machine learning approach, machine learning models need lots of training examples. And as far as we were aware, no, uh, no labeled data. There was not, no such data sets existed publicly that had a set of Flemish tweets uh, that were labeled uh, with their sentiments. So we made that ourselves, which is also quite a challenge uh, that includes a lot of uh, research questions on its own. So while this bird's eye view I said, seems easy, and I'm a data scientist or a computer scientist, so indeed, technically, you could set this up in a couple of days programming relatively easily. But then if you look at it from a from an official statistics point of view, it's almost like Pandora's box to go from what you can get working to what you feel confident publishing as a statistical authority and understand very well. There's a lot of questions that need answering. Here's a couple of them. It's not an exhaustive list by, by any means. For example, about the data, uh, if you want to label your own data, who should you ask to annotate the sentiment? If I ask you of, or if I ask someone else to annotate positive, neutral, or negative to tweets, we have observed that this differs between people, for example. Also, there's lots of uh, population bias in the data, meaning that the average Flemish citizen does not correspond with the concept of the average Flemish Twitter users. Um, there is also data reliability issues, et cetera. Also, with regards to the model, if you want to automatically assign sentiment to tweets, how are you going to do that? There's a plethora of machine learning models. There's also the lexicon-based models. Um, there's lots of choices to, to take there. And of course, we wonder 
what is the impact of a choice we make on the robustness of our statistics. In machine learning, you also, if once you have a machine learning model, there's by default some questions pop up like how, model, how long can you keep the same model? How often have, do you have to retrain it? Do you have to show it new examples, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I would just want to say many questions here. And we were very aware of these questions because when we started with this project and I mentioned to my statistical colleagues, hey, we're going to experiment with Twitter data for official statistics. I got quite a lot of skeptical looks and, and very skeptical questions. Ah, oh, this data is so biased and how are you ever going to turn it into valuable data? But I believe, and I, I definitely agree with Talita that it is possible and these are these are a lot of questions and it's hard to answer all of them, but it's definitely possible. So we, we, we really took on this challenge and one by one, we started answering these questions. Uh, for this collaboration with academia and also industry partners is critical. So here is a list of our academic work that has come out of this research track. We, we did a, a paper on comparing machine learning techniques with uh, lexicon techniques and also other uh, large language model techniques. Uh, we, we did work on annotator, annotator on mitigating annotator bias. Uh, we did also work on giving a Twitter account, predicting uh, what the social demographic features are behind those Twitter accounts, etc. We also did work on, on, on measuring sentiment on specific policy topics like lifelong learning, quality of life, political confidence. So while this the screenshot of the, the dashboard earlier is about like generic tweets about any topic, we also deep dove into specific uh, policy areas which were of interest. And yeah, so just to show, it's Pandora's box when you really want to make this an official statistic, but it is possible with the help of the right partners, for example, academia. So we were really, the next slides, I will just give you some, some highlights of this research to show that, yeah, it might be hard, might be a lot of questions, but you can definitely tackle those questions. So um, the data we used in our, in our own setup um, came from the Twitter, Twitter uh, V2 API, so version two. We filter approximately 1% of all the tweets with some extra filters on top of it. So to approximate what we call Flemish tweets, we selected tweets in Dutch language coming from either Belgium, Flanders, or a Flemish town or city. So Twitter doesn't really have a very clean um, location filter. Users can fill it in themselves. So they can just say Belgium. They can say from wherever. They can basically fill it in themselves, which gives some, some, uh, some challenges. But we made a definition there. We excluded retweets or replies. And while uh, the, one of the earlier questions showed you can use audio message or you probably could also extract um, sentiment from images, we also excluded those just to, to, uh, to keep our research uh, scoped. So as mentioned, so no, no data set existed with examples. So we, in collaboration with, a, with an industry partner, we did a, a labeling exercise. So we hired three job students to what I think is one of the most boring jobs in the world. So over the course of a month, they labeled around 50,000 tweets that were sampled from a, from a quite large time window of five years time. And some of those tweets were annotated just by one of the annotators, but also a nice proportion of the tweets were labeled by multiple annotators. So we can see how the different annotators uh, compare with regards to their labeling consistency. So this was set up in a, a very nice tool called Prodigy. So if you ever need to do some manual labeling, Prodigy is a, a nice tool for that. Yeah, we, we gave those uh, annotators some clear instructions. I think we also just took a version there. I think if we do it in the future again, we probably would change our instructions a bit here and there. But you really have to give them clear instructions on what you mean is the sentiment, how they should think of the sentiment, what, should, what they should do if the tweet is unclear or they don't really know. So you really have to explain it very clearly to them what you want and uh, how you want those labels to behave. Otherwise, uh, they're going to be all over the place. What we saw is, uh, yeah, we also incorporated some nice tricks in the labeling. So it's, it's a lot of work to label those tweets. And you don't want them to label all kinds of the same tweets. So we use two approaches to improve labeling efficiency. So we, we try to give the annotators different tweets. So not all tweets on, on soccer games or all tweets on a, 
uh, the latest Game of Thrones episode. You know, we wanted the tweets to be different enough, so we have a lot of sentiment labels about a lot of topics. So we used uh, language embeddings to do it. So we embedded a set of tweets, and then we took um, tweets that have, had very distant language embeddings, and we provided them to the annotators. Secondly, we also used active learning. So the labeling and the model training were done simultaneously. So the model was training. And whenever there was a tweet that it had a high uncertainty about, like, oh, this is a very, it's not a clear positive or a negative or a neutral, those tweets that were not easy to categorize were also prioritized uh, for human labeling as well. And I'm sure there's a lot of smart tricks you, you can add on top of that as well, but we, we stuck with those too. Uh, one interesting observation, which, which made it already quite challenging from a statistical point of view, is that annotators had uh, different opinions. So what you can see here on the screen is our three annotators, A, B, and C. And on the edges between the annotators, you can see the agreement. So for example, if you take annotator A and B, the tweets that both of them labeled, only 61.52% of the times, they agreed on the label of that tweet. And you can see A and C had a similar uh, agreement. B and C agreed with each other a bit more frequently. But in general, this, is, this was to me a surprisingly low amount. And it gets even a bit more challenging because if you look at the tweets that all of them, all three of them labeled, you only get almost a 51% agreement. So this really showed us, well, we have to be very careful about who we ask to annotate these tweets because depending on who we ask, we will get different results. And we want our sentiment statistic to be representative for our region, not to be representative of one accidental person who we chose to, to label our data. So this was one research challenge that was uncovered. Furthermore, there's also yeah a lot of bias. Uh, we, we tried to, so this, this observation that people differ with regard to their sentiment labeling, we did a, a further master thesis on this, and we observed the link between um, social demographic features and how people label. So actually it was not a very surprising observation, but it was good to see confirmed is that people with uh, similar age, gender and location where they live, label tweets more similarly than people who differ in terms of age, gender or location. So in both of these three social demos, we saw big differences. So this, this leads us to the conclusion that when we would do a new labeling to create a new ground truth data set, um, so we would need a panel either representative of the Flemish Twitter user or have someone similar as the author of the tweet label the tweet. So there we can be a bit smarter than just hire three job students who had uh, a month available in their summer. So this is one, I think, key finding of our research that, that would help us going forward. So secondly, there's Talita also mentioned this, that of course there is a bias in the population. The Twitter population is not representative of the famous population. So we also try to measure this, but unfortunately you don't, you don't have this information available on Twitter. So we try to create a, a prediction model using all the information we can find on a person's bio. So I think that's the name, maybe the picture, I'm not, I'm not quite sure, but also what they tweet about. So with quite some confidence, we can predict the gender of a person. Of course, the name on its own is often quite indicative. We could uh, identify with 74% accuracy in which province in Flanders this person was living. And there was, uh, I think, a six, six age categories. And I think with 55% accuracy, we could uh, categorize in which age group this person was following. So this is very useful, these types of models that we were experimenting with is once you can identify, okay, this person has these social demographic properties, that's an opening to start correcting your biases and to start uh, labeling your tweets better. But, and, and I, I mentioned this in the end, more work is clearly needed because this is not uh, very high for some of these social demographic features. Our machine learning model, I will not give too much time to this. I think we used what was then, uh, which is 2019, 2020, state of the art in uh, natural language processing, it's a Roberta transformer model. It was, uh, we used uh, Robert, which is a Dutch pre-trained transformer model trained at one of our universities. And we fine tuned the, the classification head with our label data set uh, to come up with our own sentiment model. Yeah, there's lots to say about what performance mean, but I, I will skip this for the, for the sake of time. Um, a last study that I will mention before I come to my conclusion is that we made a, a generic 
Twitter dashboard means there's tweets on all topics of society, about soccer, about politics, about whatever you can think. And we wanted to have a better idea of like what's actually going on there. So first of all, it's a, we we hired a, a, a thesis student who did this work for us. And he looked at, can we explain the peaks and the valleys um, in, in, in our sentiment score? Like what happened here that there's a peak or why are people positive or what are people negative about? So yeah, he made a, a simple peak and valley detection algorithm. It's not too hard. But then he looked at what were the most frequent words at a specific uh, peak and what were the most positive words or most negative words at a specific peak or valley. So in this case, it says Alms Clue. It means that the soccer club Antwerp played the soccer soccer team Club Bruges. And uh, clearly this indicates, okay, at that moment, a lot of people were tweeting about a soccer game. But you can also see in the most positive words, <clears throat> apologize, that eight Mubarak it was a the the festive the festival of eight like a, and a lot of people were tweeting positively about death. So every, every, every time there's a holiday, we observe that okay this this often occurs in the most positive and the most frequent work. So this is, this gives some at least some feeling about what's happening here rather than just having a quite an opaque timeline. Yeah. Secondly, uh, we took all our tweets and we actually want to see in Flanders, what are people actually tweeting about in this big data set of thousands or millions of tweets? What are we actually capturing about society, about which topics? So we did a, a clustering of all our tweets to a low dimensional space. Here you can see it, I'm, uh, you can see it projected on a 2D plane, so it's a bit more visual. Here on the bottom, you can see definitely specific groups and, and each color indicates a specific cluster. Um, so what we then did is we, for each cluster, each of these clusters, we took the, the most frequent used words. And then of course, these, I cannot make a presentation and not mention ChatGPT uh, at this time of day. So we used GPT, I think it was a nice use. So we gave ChatGPT those most frequent used words per cluster. And then we asked it, can you please assign uh, a fitting word that would cover these most frequently used words? So if, for example, the, the blue cluster, that's a lot of, emo it's about emotions, people showing generic emotions on Twitter. Um, here, the green cluster is tweets about a specific conflict. Um, apparently it was also a Eurovision around that time. So where these, all these pink tweets were, were about the Eurovision Song Contest. So you can see this, this gives an ID to us but like, what are people actually tweeting about? So this gives a bit more confidence or a bit more context that we can provide to users of any potential statistic coming out of this work. So yeah, um, also our work stopped. That's a bit, that's a, a big bummer actually. So in 2022, Elon Musk acquired Twitter. And at one point we were paying almost nothing for our data. So I think we paid 200 euros a month to run our experiment. And it went from 200 a month to 40,000 a month at one point. And, and, and then even later, it just got suspended. So for us, uh, as an experimental statistic, it just became too expensive and now even impossible, I think. So we decided to just discontinue the statistic and, and this work for now. This led into us doing some reflection as a statistical agency about working with these types of data sources that we, we don't have control over. So generally, statistical offices have a lot of control about the surveys they send out, or they, they, they are the owner of registry information. But these types of data sources, you're, you're at the goodwill of whoever is um, providing you with this type of data. So I think we wrote an interesting paper, I think especially written by Cedric, uh, an ex-colleague of mine, about if you, as a statistical agency, want to embark on experiments or statistical development with external data sources, Here's a list of all the potential risks uh, you should take into account. And also here's some suggestions on how you can alleviate those risks. So for example, one of the, the alleviation strategies here could be to have a, a direct data agreement with Twitter or some SLAs. So at least you can count on these data being sent to you continuously. So that is, this has been one of the nice lessons for us. And for example, now we're, we're, we're working on a project using Strava data, there's a sports app, and we're very aware of, okay, this, this data source can disappear at any moment, and we're taking this into account before we put a lot of effort into this. So I have two 
concluding uh, slides. Sorry if I go a bit over time. So I have a question here. Should we use social media data for official statistics? And I tried to answer this question using the quality dimensions presented by Eurostat. So let's go over them quickly. And this is just my personal take. I'm, I'm curious to hear if Talita has different opinions on this. So one of the, the first quality dimension is relevance. Is it a relevant statistic? I'm convinced that yes, it contains information on important domains, so which just makes it quite relevant. I think accuracy and reliability is quite challenging. For regarding accuracy, I think this requires a lot more research on statistical properties and also what is the what are the fundamental concepts that are actually being measured in this data. Reliability, yeah, that's a, a big no-no at the moment. So we definitely require stronger data, data sharing agreements with data providers here. Timeliness and punctuality. Yes, I think that's a big win. I think one of the key selling points of using social media for statistics is that you can have like quasi real time, super frequent data. Comparability and coherence. I think between regions work that Talita presented like the Gross National Happiness Project is key here. So we did this a bit on ourselves. So we contacted or collaborated with external partners as well. But I think we really need to share methods uh, internationally so that we, if we make something in Flanders and they make something in South Africa, that it measures the same thing using the same methods and what comes out of it is comparable. Regarding accessibility and clarity, I think this is, this is quite all right. I mean, you can make this available so it's quite accessible. Clarity, I think this requires a better understanding of which real life constructs are actually being measured. So it's my, my last slide. I think there's a yes that you can say, a lot of my colleagues are also saying a no. I understand both of them. In short, I think that I'm convinced that there's opportunity for value. However, we do require more research and I definitely uh, emphasize we do require joint work within the statistical community. The reason to say no is that, yeah, there's obvious imperfections in this data. However, I say these imperfections can be overcome. And also, I can be quite cheeky and say to my more traditional colleagues, there's definitely also imperfections in survey data and in administrative data as well. Yeah. So uh, for me, it's too soon to tell. We need to work on this, but I'm convinced this is useful data for society. Yep. And I'm going to skip over this. If you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them now. For all questions regarding the data science we do, work we do at Statistics Flanders, feel free to send me an email at the following email address. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, so I receive a couple of questions. <clears throat> okay, so one is from uh, a student. Could, could you please uh, explain again which are the main differences between the two approaches, lexicon and machine learning? Yeah, so in a... In a lexicon-based model, you have. I'm going to simplify it a bit. You mm -hmm. have a, a yeah, vocabulary sure. of words. Let's say all the words in your dictionary, and each of those words are going to be assigned a score. For example, the word "happy" is going to have a very as might have a score of plus zero point eight, and the word of "murder" might have a score of minus one. And you just sum up all the scores of each words in your tweet. And then if you get a positive result, you end up with a positive sentiment. If you have a negative result, you end up with a negative sentiment. So that's, that's a lexicon approach. It's the approach that Talita presented. And it's, it's, it's been around for a while. It, it, it works quite well. The machine learning approach uh, tries to uncover a bit deeper the, the information uh, in the sentences. So what it does, it takes a lot of examples. So it takes a tweet and the label of a tweet says either positive or negative. And if you give it thousands of examples, the machine learning model, it will figure out on its own uh, what, the, what the sentiment is. And the advantage of it, I think, and what we show that it works a bit better than lexicon in our approach, but the advantage also is, is that language is very complex. Uh, and just summing up what these scores of the lexicons, you, you ignore uh, a large part of the lexicon and how different words interact with each other. Thank you, thank you, very clear. Uh, and then another question. So uh, thank you to both. Uh, you mentioned that you can in some ways try to predict the characteristic of the person writing the tweet. Do you think that in the future you could also compute indexes that differentiate by gender, for example? 
Could this be possible also for the index presented by Talita? Or do you think that the personal characteristics should be used only for evaluating the quality of the index in a yeah, validation approach? Yeah, so if once you have a model that confidently predicts the gender, um, you, could, you could split up your data set on, on gender and, and, and make a different uh, male or female sentiment statistic. You could do that if there is a, an interest in this. It's definitely possible. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, oh, <laughs> are the codes and data in some ways that you use uh, uh, publicly available or not? No, um, they're not publicly available because we're talking about, per, uh, we had a big discussion about our data <laughs> protection officer in this project. And even though they're public, you can see these tweets, they're still personal information and we cannot, as a processor of that information, we don't feel comfortable just sharing that. Okay, sure, sure. Uh, and this, uh, I, I have a question that I usually pose because uh, okay, our students maybe could have an interest in, okay, not producing the index like we are doing, but are you aware, I mean, if in R or in other codes, uh, there are some libraries that can already be used to try to, I would say, start working in this field, What, how, where students could start, if you have any suggestion or just, I don't know, study, reading your uh, work, any specific uh, suggestion? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, any data source that's available and they can access, there's often mm -hmm. APIs, you point to that. But I'll, there, I would focus on alternatives then, as a bit as Talita mentioned, there's some great future avenues. Mm -hmm. I know of, there's great work being done also by the private sector in Belgium on using news articles and, uh, to create a new sentiment, for example, rather than just a Twitter sentiment, just sentiment in the news that's being done quite successfully. Um, yeah, wh whatever they're passionate about, <laughs> have a try. I think that, that I would say. Talita, you would like to add something? Um, I would like to add, you know what, experience. I think any of the students, they... Well, I love my work and I love to enjoy anything new. And, and, and this is a field that develops so quickly. I mean, natural language processing with AI and something like ChatGPT, the, the, the quick, uh, the future is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, as Michal is also saying is, I believe big data is the future. I, I mean, that's where we're going to. We can't stop it. We have to develop with that. And I would like to invite the students to go and look at the different libraries available in Python, even in R, which all do sentiment analysis. And as I said, there's sentiment analysis, um, there's libraries that actually can analyze the sentiment, the sentiment on, um, on, on voice, so voice recognition. There's now virtual recognition and just see what you get. Go go and play around. We you never know what's in the market till you actually went out and tested it. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you to both. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Um, so I would like to Thank you uh, again for the uh, great presentations. And uh, many thanks also to our participants who join us today. And participants, you will be invited to fill in a short survey about today's webinar. The survey will open in your browser just after the end of the Zoom meeting. If you don't have time right now, you will receive a link by email to fill in the survey later on. We really appreciate your feedback to further improvement of our webinars. Uh, actually, this is was the last this was the last webinar of this uh, EMOS program. Uh, so I thank you, uh, uh, I thank everyone who attended these and other um, EMOS webinars. So for future EMOS activities, don't forget to follow the EMOS account on LinkedIn and keep an eye for the new EMOS webpage on Cross, which contains a lot of uh, useful and interesting information. So thank you again to Talita and Michael for this presentation uh, and have a nice day. Thank you, bye. Thank you, Katrin. Thank you, Michal. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.